Hello and welcome to Eye Openers. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Wherever you are listening or watching this, I thank you so much for tuning in because without you guys, I would just kind of be talking to empty space, but I at least would be having fun doing it and drinking my favorite beverage, coffee. So I, I do that stuff kind of by myself anyways. I'll just give you like a little bit of insight here. Sometimes I have these conversations in my head. I practice them out loud. I mean, who hasn't done that before? But it is more fun when there are other people benefiting from the conversation. And I'm not just talking to myself today. I have my friend Daniel Felt here today. Thanks so much for joining, Daniel. Thank you, Brittany. I'm really excited. Now, you know, first question, do you ever talk to yourself just like I just disclosed there? Tell me I'm not alone. You know, I don't know if it's it's if it's quite out loud, but <laughs> man, on, the, on the inside, the, 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 the mental conversations that are had and then the worst though is when you like leave a conversation, maybe it's like a sales meeting or something like that. You're like, oh, if I only would have said this, it would have gotten so much better. So I'm I'm there with you, maybe not verbally out loud, but on the inside, I'm there. Yeah, totally. I find like the shower is the best time to reflect on management conversations, like leadership stuff. Like, how did I do? How can I do that better? You know, just um, just thinking it through, right? And sometimes yeah. that's the only time, I don't know about you, I have two little kids and I'm not often alone. And so- I just got to take any kind of reflection time or space when it hits me. But right now we're not so much, well, we are going to do some reflecting too on your business, how you got to where you are, which is an amazing, amazing place. And we're going to hear about, you know, what skill set got you there, all that good stuff. But we have something very important that we cover first here, which is what are you drinking? The show is called Eye Openers for a reason. We look for eye-opening beverages, which mine happens to be coffee. Caffeine does it for me. How about you? Yeah, I'm a I'm a huge coffee drinker myself. So <laughs> black coffee just it does wonder. So every every morning I I'm a I'm a better version of myself if I've got a cup or two cup of coffee. So uh, this time of day I'm happy to have another one. I'm sure uh, that'll lead into the night, but that's all right. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking one, you know, for that we can have uh, the best version of Daniel here on the call. I like that. It's, it helps me be the best version of myself. I'm going to say that tomorrow morning. My kids are like, mommy, why are you drinking so much coffee? This makes me the best version of myself. So watch yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's for their own good, most definitely. For their good. That's right. <laughs> for the good of the community, too. Um, so, Daniel, let me give you a proper introduction here because um, you definitely deserve it. And I'd like to give the audience a little bit of like reason why they should be listening to the things you say. Um, so you are the CEO and founder of Cura Home. You started that in 2016, so not that long ago, but you already have um, 32 employees. So you've grown just from being in your garage, which I love those stories. That's how all good businesses start, right? And now you're in four different states as well as those 32 employees like we talked about. Um, focusing on high quality work at a fair price, Cura Home services over 600 homes on a quarterly basis, completing their routine maintenance needs. So uh, hello, who lives in a house? Everybody. And it's a really, um, I can't wait to tell the audience about how you came to this service idea and, and how it's working out for you. Your goals for 2022 include selling 10 franchises. So everybody listen up. I have so many entrepreneurs. And becoming a franchisee is one of those ways. So everybody pay attention today. Um, you're currently reading or listening to 52 books. That's your goal for the year. And servicing a total of 1,000 homes for the routine maintenance needs. So you're going to grow that by 400 new customers. Okay. In your free time, you enjoy being a husband, father, camping, hiking, marathons, ultra marathons, and Ironman triathlons. So if you didn't feel lazy before this episode, now you do. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, and you're also a private pilot and a certified home inspector. Okay. That was the list, you guys. That's the brief bio. I can't imagine what's on the longer one. T tell us, Daniel, how does one do an ultra marathon? You know, that is probably my least favorite race I've ever done. Uh, triathlon wise, <laughs> yeah, I think I've done. Why. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. You, when you have a side ache walking, Brittany, you're, you're on a different level of pain, but, uh, you know, 28 triathlons, that's nice because you get a break, right? You swim and that was really natural for me. Then you bike, then you get to run and that's, that's fine. But the ultra marathon, I got done. My buddy talked me into it. It's like, it's fine. And I looked at the terrain map of the course 
And I'm like, you know, actually that's not that bad, but I missed a very key detail. That's actually two loops. So the train was twice as bad as I thought it was. And at, at the middle of the loop, I like, you know, midway through, I was like, is anyone going to care if I even quit? Cause this is so dumb, but I uh, finished the race. I got to say I've completed an ultra marathon and it, it, it may be the only one that I ever do unless I change a lot, but there's, I, I think I'm done with ultra marathons. So just for those of us who don't know, like how many miles is that? Yeah, that one was a 50 K. So it was 31 miles. And the, the, the difference that five miles extra above a marathon, I think I've ran six marathons and, and those, those, are fine, but that extra five miles does something to you that mentally. And like I said, I was literally walking the last like four miles with a side ache, and that's that's a different level of uh, of discomfort. But glad yeah. glad we're done with that. Yeah. So um, you've heard it here first. If you can run an ultra marathon, you can build a big successful business, right? You just it's the same kind of thinking. That yeah, I mean it's it's definitely you're in it for the long run, right? Right. <laughs> You, yeah, definitely long run. You have to, it's, it's, you have to think of it. It's like, it's every, every step along the way, you've got to train for it. You've got to do your research. You have to make sure you're getting the right things in your body, like ultra marathon, mm -hmm. you know, learning on business wise, getting nutrition, you know, the 52 books a year that I'm listening to surrounding yourself with people that believe in what you're doing, right. Whether it be a race or a business, if you're around people all day long, that say, there's no way you can do that race. I can almost guarantee you're not going to, but you surround yourself with people that say you can do it, or they say, I've done it before. Here's how it's very, very similar. There's, there's a lot of similarities between training for races and running a business or, or having a career. I love it. I just threw that at you guys. Like seriously, you guys, he did not have any prep for that. That was not in the questions I gave him. And he just banged that out. The analogy is really, really right on. I mean, I say it all the time, like business is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. So slow down, change your trajectory, like change, you know, your, what you're looking at here. Um, but like you said, the training, what you put in yourself, how are you taking care of yourself every day? makes a huge difference in how you're able to show up. Um, so, so there's been some interesting points for you along the way here since you started. Um, tell me a little bit about maybe those first few years, you know, I know, um, you've been through the pandemic, right. In a, in a very soon after starting, you had, um, some situations where growth happened very quickly to give us um, a few bullet points of what it's been like for Cura Home. Yeah, for sure. I, a really important lesson that I learned is I, when talking before I started this company, right, you talk to people that are brighter and smarter than you are and more successful. And, and I heard hundreds of people be like, that's such a great idea. You should for sure do this. And our initial concept was actually where we would visit your home once a month. And after I became a certified home inspector and knowing everything that needs to be done maintenance wise, I believe, and I, I, I still, I mean, I'm, I'm checking on my house on a monthly basis, but the market didn't want monthly visits. And even though that sounded really great and everyone thought that's a really good idea, no one was actually pulling out their checkbook or credit card mm -hmm. to sign up for that service. Mm -hmm. And so I finally sat down with the gentleman from my church and he knew me really well. I knew his son really well. And I, he loved, he was for sure our target client lived in a very nice home. And I just asked like, Joe, why aren't you a client? Like I, it's fine that you're not, but why not? And we sat down at the coffee shop. We talked for about an hour. And at the end of the day, he said, realistically, I just don't want you in my house once a month. Like I think quarterly would be just fine. And it kind of, it, it clicked with me. I followed up with a ton of clients that I had given an estimate to. And I don't think they really knew why they didn't sign up, but they were just like, we know we need this stuff, but I just don't need it. And I, I said, I, if I change the price and I change the word monthly to quarterly, would you sign up? And we were in business for about half of 2016 and we had signed on 11 clients. And on January 2nd, I very excitedly called all those people and I followed up and I, and I asked them that question and 11 more people signed up for the routine maintenance quarterly visits. So Cure Home doubled in a day. I don't think we could ever do that again. There's, there's no way, but we, we doubled that day just by listening to the market and asking your target market questions like, what do you need? Like, what are your pain points? And rather than listening to like them, you know, like your neighbors or your friends or really smart people telling you it's a really good idea. I almost want to say like, if you're, if you're thinking about starting your own company or anything like that, I would say, make people prove it. Be like, so you're telling me right now, if I offered it to you, you'd sign up. And, and when I was offering monthly, they say, well, I don't need it, but like my neighbor does. And, and, and if you get that answer, you've got to, you're, you're almost there. You got a few more tweaks to make. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a really, really valid point. I hear that all the time. Well, like, oh, I asked all these people and they said they would buy it. And I yes. say, yeah, but did they? Right. You know, and you can really ask that question on the spot. I mean, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable, but you're you're going to get an answer. And having that information is so much more valuable than not really having any clear answer and not knowing what you know which direction you need to move or what the market really dictates there. For sure. Really important. And then tell me, you know, what happened for you guys? So you doubled in a day. Um, you started to gain some traction, um, and how, you know, how did you get from, from those, you know, first six, seven months to where you are now? And now you're looking at franchising and, and, and you have, you're in four different States. How do you go from like one, you know, location with a set of employees that are right in front of you managing that to now looking at a different state? What does that look like? What were you guys considering? Yeah. I think the really short answer is systems and processes for days. That's like mm -hmm. systemize everything. Like and my, my goal, and even though I'm happy to do this, but my goal is that I'm never asked the same question twice. So, so if, if someone's asked it, we need to get that documented. We need to get it into our training program so that the next person is equipped and they're going to be a more successful team member faster by knowing that information. But the long answer is trial and error, right? We, so 2017, we started, we were just offering that routine maintenance services and people don't Google routine maintenance. And so figuring out how do you educate the public in an affordable manner? And a lot of people, because one of those services that we offer when we're visiting once a quarter is dryer vent cleaning. A mm -hmm. lot of people ask if we do air duct cleaning. And at the time I was like, no, you know, I, I haven't heard good things about air duct cleaners and blah, blah, blah. And, but I, I met this guy once and I was referring jobs to him. And it actually ended up that one of the weeks in the middle of 2017, I, I referred enough work to him that I'm pretty sure he was doing more in sales for my referrals than I was doing just from the routine maintenance. <laughs> and then you kind of start to analyze like, why don't I just offer air duct cleaning? And so we bought a really popular machine that was like highly rated, all this stuff. And we started using it and growing up on a farm and helping my parents build their dream home. I felt like I had a really good understanding how to do quality work and how a home works as well from that sort of becoming a certified home inspector as well. Mm -hmm. And I was not happy with the machine. So did a ton of research today. When we add a van, we actually order equipment from about 11 different manufacturers to make sure that we can clean air ducts up to our standards. So um, after that, uh, in 2018, I hired a business coach and best decision I ever made because they, say this. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> this is not paid, not queued up, but I, I originally met with that, that person, Brittany, and, and they laid out and they said, what are you doing right now? And I was working in my business very heavily. I was on every job. In fact, the, I had one employee at the time. He couldn't get to the job if I wasn't there. Cause I pulled a little trailer with my pickup truck to get to all mm -hmm. these jobs. And they go, if, if you were not in, if you were not on a job site, how many customers could you get per week? And I said, well, I think I could get about two a week if I was 40 hours, just sell, sell, sell. And at the time we were doing $8,000 a month in sales. And they said, we think that by the end of the year, you could do $25,000 a month. If you were, if you would just buy a van, I left that meeting. I went to the bank. I got approved for a van and I, my employee was ready to go. He had worked side by side with me for six months. He knew everything I knew. And he went out and as soon as we got that van going, he was booked out like a week because I was focusing on the business yeah. and I needed a second van super fast. I was scared to buy the second van, but that December we actually did $28,000 in sales. So awesome. continue systems processes, train all that stuff, start documenting everything. Uh, 2019, we grew to four crews. You know, the recurring um, revenue model was really great. Well, it's so crazy. I just want to stop you right there. Like you can only, you can't see what you can't see. You know, you were like so in the weeds of your business doing what you thought was the right thing to do, which was providing just excellent service and, right. and trying to differentiate, differentiate yourself through quality. Yeah. Right. But there was just one little, one little mindset shift right there. Like well, right. what would become possible for you, Daniel, if you change the way you spent your time in your business? Oh right. my gosh. All of a sudden now it's scalable. Right. Mm -hmm. And now the sky's the limit and, and here's proof of it right there. So you guys, it's just, it's not that there's anything that's going to be, you know, just blow you out of the water here. Fireworks. I feel like people are waiting for that sometimes when they meet with me, well, where's the fireworks? Where's the crazy mm -hmm. suggestion that I'm paying for? It's like, no, I can show you the thing though, that you can't see simply by just being outside of your brain. You know, right. and we do, we're all guilty of it. I have my own coach because there's things that I can't see. Well, come on. How am I supposed to convince people to invest in this kind of service if I don't do it myself and I don't know what I'm talking about? Right. So. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. And when I came home, I think the best part about that 
when I met with, with the business coach, I came home, my wife and I had just gotten married like three months ago and mm-hmm. I was talking to her about it and, you know, learning how to navigate that because she's kind of part of the business now. Cause you know, even though she's had her own job, but I remember we were getting ready to leave and I was kind of trying to end the conversation. I, I said, I think where I'm at is I don't want to be standing here in a year and be wondering where would I have, where would I be if I would have started working with a coach? And because I, I kind of know where I'm going to be without them. And it's going to be, you know, I'm going to be hands in air ducts, right? You're changing filters, you're doing yeah. stuff, which, which is yeah. nice at times to go out and do it. But I really had a vision of getting to the point where I was working on the business. And yeah, just having that person that you trust, they, they're looking at it from the outside viewpoint. They're talking to other businesses that are going through other trials and errors. So they're helping you with best practice. It was so helpful for me. And, and it's very highly recommended. I'd say that was an extreme pivotal, pivotal moment for me and the company. Right. Well, and I think the thing you're also describing is, do you want a business or do you want a job? Right. Yeah. Right. Because you had given yourself a nice self-employed job yep. with a crazy boss, De- very demanding. Lots of that. Exactly. Hours. He's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> and that's too, like when you're looking at the long set, I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, are building a company that they want to be able to sell one day. Maybe it's to your kids or to employees or, or on the market, whatever it is. But to build it to sell, like you need to be replaceable in your business. And if you're trying to sit in a meeting and, and sell your business and your phone's going off the hook and you're you're extremely needed, in my opinion, it brings the value down of that business. But if you can walk away for a week or maybe two weeks and go on vacation and everything runs smoothly, you're and and we're not quite there yet where everything just runs 100 percent without me. But it's the goal, right? That's that to get to that point. So we get there and, and it takes baby steps. It's it's a ultra marathon. So start yeah. taking your snacks and eat your food packets. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's coming back full circle. So, well, to build off of that, I want to ask you, everybody knows my favorite question. If we were to speak three years from now and I call you up and I'm like, hey, I'm still drinking coffee. Like, tell me what you're up to. It's been three years. And you say, oh, Brittany, so great to hear from you. I'm still drinking um, my coffee, running my ultra marathons. What would you have accomplished that you want to tell me about? Just personally, yeah. professionally, what is, you know, what are you looking at achieving three years from now? Yeah, I'd say personal, personally, we would, uh, my wife and I would, would still be uh, doing our date nights once a month, which is really important. That's on the schedule for sure. We'd still mm-hmm. never be missing dinner together. That's really, really important. Work can oh, stop. We never miss dinner. Business-wise, I would say that by the end of that third year, we just sold our 60th mm-hmm. franchise. We sold 10 this year, 20 the next, and we sold 30 that third year. So we're at 60 uh, successful, happy franchisees, and I would be, I'd be, i be jumping for joy at, at the success of those uh, franchisees. Awesome. Very cool. And so what... You know, what What do you think, I mean, this is this feels like an obvious question, but it's important to articulate out, what is the greatest opportunity right now? Like, what is the thing you can be doing right now to get to that place three years from now? Yeah, I think for me, I recently listened to the book, Who Not How, which was just mm. awesome. Highly recommend it. It was really great. It's about finding tasks that someone else could do. And, and a lot of times... I'll, I'll think about an item or a task that's being done by me. And I'm like, well, no one else could really, it could do it as fast or as quick or whatever. And then I delegate it and it's done better and faster. And I'm like, why do I not learn that? So for me, I think the, the things that I really need to be working on is the forward thinking and the projections of, of what, do, what do we need to be doing in six months, you know, so that we can continue, you know, what do we need to be doing today? What do, you need, what do we need to be doing in six months? And you're constantly forecasting that. And it's okay to put it on a whiteboard and, and erase it and say, we actually took a small pivot here. And so now we're at this point. And we've had to do that as a company. And, you know, you take a sharp right-hand turn here or there. But it's for sure focusing on forward thinking and then leading the team successfully. I, I almost think of myself, sometimes I'm a, I'm a coach for the team, but a lot of times I'm a team captain. And you're, you're right there. You're with everyone. You're getting stuff done. But you have to step away. And for me, it's like you get away. Maybe you go and rent out like a one-bedroom cabin somewhere with no internet and no phone. And you just... Just think about what's going on. And and Brittany, you talked about, you know, your thoughts that like in the shower, you're, you're alone, you can do this stuff. A guy who I have a ton of respect for, I, I was listening to him, he's, he's local, but I was listening to him speak. And he had his goals laminated and he puts them in the shower at a time where he, when he's doing a shampoo, he's staring at it right at his goals. And I absolutely love that. Now when I'm in the shower, I'm looking at my blank tiles. I'm like, well, man, I'm, I'm a loser here. I need my goals written up there. But it's just keeping that stuff focused. And I think that, it's interesting coming from like a, you know, a long distance 
athlete and and you think like you should be patient with this stuff but i'm so impatient and it's like you have to take time to reflect and and uh reward your team both like verbal praise or maybe it's time off or if you can financially and take time to like celebrate the little wins but also keep plowing forward to to finish that long distance race Mm -hmm. really really great point that there's no way you're going to get to 60 franchises alone and right. and paying that proper recognition and praise and, and rewarding them in the ways that are meaningful for them not just mm -hmm. guessing but i believe in asking the team you know what's what's a meaningful reward um that's really really important so thanks for bringing that up um you know, so along the way here, like, you, you know, you've been having these reflections, you've been, you know, investing in coaches and in figuring out how to, you know, um, just constantly better yourself and see the opportunities. What are some breakthroughs that you've had that has really changed the way that you uh, lead or see your business, like key moments, like these eye opening moments? Yeah, I think the, you know, the statement I think of is, it's been said a million different ways, but you can't be everything to everyone like understanding who your target market is and, and don't have like a million services listed out across the top of your website. And, and we've, we, it seemed like it'd be a perfect fit handyman. We launched it. We went hardcore in 2021 and, and luckily we had the wisdom or I don't know, someone you know, like we, 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 we kiboshed it. We had to, because it wasn't craftsmanship isn't scalable. And so you have to know that and know that if a handyman in Minnesota cannot you know, repair a drywall patch and a wall the same way that the guy in Denver can, you know, you're not, you're not running a, a great enterprise. So making sure that, you know, you, the things that you're doing are scalable and that you're not trying to be everything to everyone. Don't be a yes man, be able to say, these are our core services. I know we do these really, really well. And this is what we're going to stick to. And that's what we've gotten to with our routine maintenance package or air duct cleaning. That's, that's what we do. That's who we are as a company and that's our identity. And, and we're sticking to that. And when we stick to that, those core focuses, we can grow at the rate that we, you know, close to the rate that we want to be growing at. Awesome. Okay. So this is a tough one. And just so you guys know, I talk to everybody before we do these live ep episodes because I, well, I want to know that they're cool first of all, but secondly, so that um, I know that they're willing to share some of these things because sharing what hasn't gone right and where things have not worked out the way that you thought, like offering the handyman services is such an important story to tell. There's way too many books out there, way too many platforms that just sell you the story of success. Mm -hmm. And maybe they talk about challenges, but, but you know what there, it's so important to see the whole picture here to understand that you're just one, um, strat you know strategic risk away from mm -hmm. getting to where you want to go or you're you're or you're two trials away from nailing it that there's going to be you need to embrace the concept of things not working out in order to really get to the place that you want to be if you want a different outcome than you have you have to be willing to do things differently and that can feel really scary so um tell us daniel you know you just shared that one story about you know a service offering not working out what would you identify as as your biggest weakness or something that's holding you back from getting there? Yeah, I would say just to, to probably get super vulnerable here. I think the largest challenge in trying to grow a business is when you go from the point where you're managing everyone as a business owner, and then you try to get managers in place and there becomes a, a roadblock between some of your like customer facing for us, it'd be like client care coordinators or technicians that are out in the field and they have their managers and then it's then it's me and i i believe that you you do need you know managers in place i can't manage 100 people i i would i wouldn't have any hair and, and i'd look a lot older but i there's my biggest weakness is, is getting things in place below that justify that and and i use example when my wife worked for the state of minnesota she wasn't making a ton of money but every time that someone would hear about her job they say oh the benefits, they must be awesome. And she's like, oh yeah, they're fine. But she like hated her job, right? So um, that so figuring out that level of how do you, how as a business owner, do you stay connected with people, even though you know they need a manager, that you know they need someone that when they call, they answer. And keeping that connection and that culture really solid is something that we definitely have been challenged with because when I directly manage everyone, I know it's their kid's birthday this weekend, right? And you can say like, hey, how was the birthday party on Monday? And and it's the culture is just great. You know, it's there. And some of those things get lost in as you try to scale a business. And we've actually had to 
slam on the brakes and back up a little bit and figure out some of those things before we can plow forward. Because, you know, life's really short. You spend 40, 45, sometimes 50 hours a week in the office with people. You want it to be a fun place. Like I, you know, I think our generation above us, a few above us was like, you, you go to work, grind it out. Like who cares about all this stuff? And, and that's different now. Like you need to create a place that people are proud of and they want to, they want to work for you. And they all believe in the same, you know, one team, one dream type deal. And that's, that's mm-hmm. for sure probably been our largest challenge this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really great point. Um, and it's sometimes hard for people to articulate, like, oh, what is that? Mm -hmm. secret sauce that I'm bringing to the table that people seem to like, or what, you know, what does make me social and charismatic and able to deliver on that, like customer service, but also that employee management that really makes a difference. And, and it's, you know, the answer is it's, it's partially who you are. It's partially Mm -hmm. decades of life experience and learning that. Mm -hmm. Um, So then how do you teach it? How do you develop it? But it is possible. I just want to encourage that role modeling first and foremost, if you don't show up and be that person consistently, nobody else is ever going to do it if you don't stay accountable to it. But then after that, there really are ways for you to start to audit and kind of take inventory of all those things you do of like keeping track of those birthdays and, Mm -hmm. and creating a system for it. Now, I think, you know, it's so funny, right at, right before this call, I have a once a month CEO kind of round table that I run of Mm -hmm. current former clients, network people. Um, I should probably get you in there, but Uh, we were just talking about how do you scale and still allow for some of that personal autonomy for employees, like how they want to do it versus how, you know, you think it should be done and not make it overly bureaucratic, which is the job you were describing that your wife is in that not everybody loves and feels kind of disconnected from. And that right. is such a challenge, right? Because the thing that makes um, a small business like feel like that second family or just, you know, you really enjoy being a part of is because of the personal impact you get to make, the decisions you get to make, kind of some of that freedom, right? And so it's it's tough to do that because everything we know about scaling is process, system, structure, right? Right. So it's a delicate balance because culture is going to make or break that business. Um, and how are you doing? How are you building culture, you know, from several states away? It's, it's a big challenge. Yes. What's something that has gone well in this? You know, we just talked about your weakness, but um, if it wasn't, if there weren't things going well, you wouldn't be where you are. So how are you doing that? Yeah, I think the best thing uh, for us has been the reoccurring routine maintenance clients. We still service client number one from 2016, which is super fun to have a relationship with those guys. But, you know, that reoccurring model is really allows you to kind of try some of these things and maybe go out on a, on a boundary because even when COVID hit, you know, we only lost two of our routine maintenance clients and and respectfully one was a pilot and there was a realtor. So you can imagine you write, you know, and that's why we don't lock people into contracts. If it's, if it's not for you, it's not for you, but the reoccurring revenue side, uh, as we've learned how to pull clients on, in a very affordable manner, knowing that no one is Googling your service. That is that is quite the challenge. But when we figured that out, it has really gone well for us. And it's always really nice to know like, hey, if we do decide to take a little bit of break and we're not pushing hard, we're still servicing these 600 routine maintenance clients. And that keeps a lot of people busy. And it it, it uh, puts a lot of food on a lot of tables for, for our employees. And that's, that's what I'm probably most thankful for. That's great. Hey, I'm curious, do you guys bill people monthly or quarterly? Yeah, you have an option. Most people get set up on a monthly bill. So um, let's say you were $300 per quarter. You're just it's automatically on the 1st or 15th, whatever you prefer, $100 comes out. And uh, like I said, you can cancel any time. Some people pay, you know, we come there and then they write a check each time we come if they prefer not to yeah. be on auto pay. That's totally fine too. I was just curious, you know, if that made a difference. Um, anyway, that's my own side question. Um, so I want to hear about what you believe, what is that number one behavior that got you to where you are today, right? But might hold you back from where you're going. Now, this is a tricky question, right? Because so often we are, we see something working in our business and then we want to double down on it, right? Like, oh, well, that's, it's working. Okay. But there are these, these inflection points where it really shifts how we need to show up or what we need to be excellent at or what our real task is in this new role changes as the business evolves. So what would you say is something that really got you to where you're at right now, but you're, you're, you're looking at differently or you're reconsidering as you're going to get to that 60 franchise mark. Yeah. I would say the biggest thing is writing down our goals. We do follow the EOS 
traction model. Which I is love really well. Yeah, it's yep. you got it. You got to do it. And uh, that guy who I was talking about who writes the goals down in the shower and all that stuff, he runs his family on EOS. Like they yeah. do 90 day offsite meetings. So, you, I mean, the guys, he's all in on it. But writing down those goals, meeting as a team once a week, deciding where are we at. We we hold each other accountable. Everyone has data points they have to put in. You know, what's the close rate? How many leads are coming in? You know, everyone has data points that they need to be hitting. And it's extremely crucial to have that. We have a shared drive where everyone's entering their information. So I think that's been really, really helpful. However, you know, you, like you said, it is a very tricky question. I think sometimes you, you get these goals down, right? And you say, oh, in three years, we want to be at 60 franchises. Well, that's great. But what if the first one is struggling, right? You need to be able to say, we're, we're going to slow down. And we're gonna we're gonna get this person the 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 uh, knowledge and the tools that they need so they can be successful. Maybe we got to go out there for a week and walk side by side with these people, whatever it takes to be successful. And so I think it's really important to ensure that your your uh, vision and your mission statement are being followed, and you don't let like this drive to go go go, you know, damage that. So it's not worth an upside client. I always say you never know when you're gonna the world's keeps getting smaller. Right. And, and you just keep on meeting more and more people. It's not worth having somebody like, Oh, we hired you guys like five years ago and we had a horrible experience. Like that's, <laughs> that's always the last thing that I want. And so always making sure that you're taking time to slow down. And I've always said, I'm willing to grow as fast as we, we possibly can, as long as we keep up our quality and our standards and, and then we're willing to grow at, at whatever rate we can. Right. So, so let me bring you back to that. So you have, you are super quality focused. And I think you have been from the beginning, right? Which is what's helped you. Now, as you grow, you're understanding that paying attention to that quality and, and speed is, or there's going to be a friction point there is what mm -hmm. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and creating systems and processes so that people aren't taking shortcuts. I think it's very natural for people. I mean, you can get really dive deep into the psychology of like taking shortcuts, but I think it's really natural for someone to want to take a shortcut or do something as simple as possible. And so when we visit each client, we actually have a really nice client form for them. It looks like a report card you'd receive in elementary school. It has everything on the left-hand side. And then there's a quarter where we check the box for each item that we do. And then we send a photo of every single thing that we did in that client form to the clients. So just keeping track of all that stuff and making sure that that quality is upheld is really, really important. Cool. Very cool. Um, so I'm not going to lie. As we have been talking, I've been thinking about maybe I should be a franchise, a franchisee. Yeah. Right? Uh, I mean, there's lots of homes here. They all need to be maintained. And a lot of them out here are empty because the homeowners have other homes, second, third, and fourth homes over here. So, um, how can people get a hold of you? Like, how can they learn more about what you're offering and how they could get involved? Yeah. If you want to reach out to me directly, LinkedIn is by far the best way. Find me on there, Daniel Felt. I'll make sure that it's linked wherever people are seeing this on the show notes or if they're yeah. ready. That's perfect. We're really active on social media, the TikTok, Instagram, oh, Facebook, cool. all okay. the things. We're doing the dances. We're doing everything on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> reach out to us, follow us. We, I think we, we just hit over 12,000 people on, on uh, Instagram. So we're, we're really active and we really love to educate people. So worst case scenario, you become a better homeowner by following us on social media. I love it. And people are loving the, like the home stuff on TikTok mm -hmm. and all like seeing the rent, you know, seeing the changes and stuff. And, and although yours is maintenance, which is like a different thing, but mm -hmm. still you could show them a before and after like cleaning. Right. And like people don't know what's in the walls. You know, if you don't, if you don't look and pay attention, you don't know. So some, someone on TikTok the other day, they opened up like they, they took their couch cushion off. And if you oh. have kids. Yes. And you take the couch cushion off, man. You have no idea what's going to be in there. Yeah, um, so it's I found a, the library book the other day. Yeah, biology <laughs> lesson in the in the couch there. So, <laughs> yeah, but that's like that's what your home is like. You know, mm -hmm. you're living in it every day. If you're not cleaning out, you know, the dark spaces, then they're right. there building up. So, um, tell us. So, people can find you on LinkedIn. We already know all of that. Um, what what is a, what is like a fun question that you get asked in this role that maybe was something you weren't expecting? Like you were expecting half of this stuff when you got into this industry. What's something that's happened like that you weren't expecting? Yeah, I think, um, I never imagined that 
we'd have like all these followers on social media. Um, we have a huge opportunity that's coming up at the end of the week. Um, like a national TV is, is airing our air duct cleaning process. Like never imagine, like they have 52 million followers on social media. Never imagine any of that would be happening. I, I also didn't think that we would have the feedback from customers that we got when, when people realize like how many items in their home that they're taking. And we've hit over 860 Google reviews in our Minnesota location. And just like reading th through those and, and seeing like how much people have learned. But I think the the best feedback that I ever got, Brittany, was actually from an employee leaving. He worked for us for three years and he worked his way up from a technician all the way up to he was my operations manager. Yeah. And he said, as he was leaving, he said, Daniel, I just want to say, I thought I knew what customer service was before I started working here. He's like, but I had no idea. And he's like, thank you for helping me understand what it's truly like to take care of a customer. And that feedback was like, it's all, yeah, it sucks to lose like your right hand man. But it was like so awesome because now he took another step up in his career and he's, you know, working at another spot now. And I hope he's taking some of those, the good that, uh, that he learned here and he's putting that into his next career. Awesome. I love that. That is such a great way to like feel your impact, like beyond mm -hmm. revenue and other things like that. You're like touching people's lives, which at the end of the day is kind of the most meaningful thing. So yeah, thank for you sure. for sharing so much with us. Thanks for showing up and being willing to tell the true story, the real story. And um, I know I had several eye-opening moments, so I hope all of you guys listening in did too. Like I said, you're going to be able to reach Daniel through all the show notes, no matter which platform you're catching this on. And until next time, guys, keep drinking whatever it is that's eye-opening for you and keep tuning in. Thanks so much.